Welcome to another episode of the Talking Europe uh, vlog. Um, my name is Dionis Dimitrakopoulos. I hold the Zamone Chair in Parliamentary Democracy and European Integration at Perkbeck, and I'm the curator of this uh, video blog series. Um, today, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present to you um, an example of what we call homegrown talent uh, at Perkbeck. Uh, Dr. Kier Andrieu, uh, I should say doctor because he recently successfully defended his doctoral thesis, got a BA, an MRes, and a PhD from uh, Berkbeck, the Department of Politics. The doctoral dissertation which he recently successfully defended uh, is entitled Sugar and Uneven Development, a historical analysis of class and state formation in Mauritius and Jamaica. Uh, the reason why I have invited Kieran to give this uh, short interview about his research uh, is that, as regular viewers will know, uh, one of the objectives behind this uh, video blog series is to showcase new research uh, that relates to Europe, broadly conceived, um, conducted within uh, Backpack. And by that, I don't only mean, obviously, research uh, done by academics, but also um, uh, younger members of staff and colleagues, and, of course, doctoral students like uh, Kieran. So um, I will ask Kieran a few questions that uh, um, have as an objective to showcase his research. And um, I should say that is, again, once again, it's a great pleasure to have him on board. So the first question is, what is the history of sugar in the EU and why does it matter as an issue? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Dionysis, uh, for having me on. Um, I'll get straight into it and answer, attempt to answer your first question. The, the history of sugar in the EU begins uh, before the EU, really. It begins with the development of sugar beet as an alternative to sugar cane in the 1860s and 70s. I won't disappear uh, too far down the botanical rabbit hole, but what I will say uh, briefly is that there are two main types of sugar, cane and beet. Cane grows in tropical climates and beet in colder climates like Europe's. Whereas, um, Cane has been around and sold for centuries upon centuries. Beet was discovered only in the 18th century, becoming a mass-produced commodity um, around 50 to 100 years later in the, in the 19th century. The, the emergence of, of sugar beet had major ramifications for producers of cane, the most profound being that it depressed the price of sugar on the world market because it represented a massive increase in the supply of the commodity. Um, for European beet producer states with large empires, for example, this was a particular challenge because it meant they had to balance the interests of both cane producers in the peripheries and beet producers in the metropole. So fast forward 100 years to the creation of the European communities in the 1950s and 60s, and we see some of these challenges, anxieties and uh, conflicts of interest carried into and reflected in the development of a comprehensive regime designed to, to, to manage the production and trade of European sugar beet and beyond. Uh, the first thing to say, I think, of any real interest about the EC and later EU sugar regime is that it made European sugar arguably the most protected commodity on the continent. The uh, Common Market Organization of Sugar, or CMO, was established in 1968, 11 years after the, the Treaty of Rome. It was subsumed within the EC's Common Agricultural Policy, or CAP, and governed um, the areas of uh, sugar beet production. Let me see if I can get this, get this completely right. Sugar beet production, sugar cane refining, uh, isoglucose and inulin production. Um, and it was also used uh, in the production of biofuels later on, like bioethanol and biodiesel, for which sugar is a common feedstock. So 
briefly to you know conclude the answer to this question as the ec and later eu expanded over the latter half of the 20th century into the 21st century so too did the cap and cmo um and at the heart of the cmo were quotas guaranteed prices export subsidies and import restrictions so a really watertight and comprehensive packet package of measures to protect European sugar producers from competition on the world market. And what's more, as the age of neoliberal reform and retrenchment dawned in the 1990s and early 2000s, the CMO survived more or less unscathed the restructuring of EU agriculture in line with so-called market principles. So the McSharry reforms in 1992 and the Fischler reforms in 2003 both heavily uh, reduced and retrenched the common agricultural policies remit. But all importantly, to this conversation at least, it left sugar largely untouched. Now, sugar wasn't protected ad infinitum. Uh, later in about 2005, 2006, there was a challenge from the WTO to the European Union on its cross-subsidised exports of sugar which they thought contravened w, WTO protocols. And thus, at that moment in time, we do, we do begin to see a retrenchment of sugar as a heavily protected commodity. But still, this begs the question, and it's not necessarily a question that I intend to answer really comprehensively or defiantly on this call, but why is it that sugar survived so much retrenchment of other agricultural industries? Sugar, which it's an important industry, but it's still relatively marginal. So what is the answer to this particular question? Uh, you have led me to this question. You know, there were these neoliberal reforms in basically every aspect of the CAP, except sugar. Uh, what are the economic and political forces that uh, uh, guaranteed this protection even in the era of neoliberalism, until the WTO's uh, challenge? Mm. Well, a very important question. I would seek to answer that conceptually, I think, through a couple of conceptual prisms. Um, and you see them throughout the literature. Then I could tell you which one I think is more likely to, to have been accurate, based on my empirical research. One school of thought says that it's all about interest groups but it's basically all about large interest groups coming together, finding actors within the commission and so on that are sympathetic. And actually, in this literature, people like Ben Richardson and others say that large sugar producers, often located outside of Europe with interests in sugar beet, calculated that it was more financially beneficial to them to actually allow sugar, some areas of sugar beet, uh, uh, to, to, to be exposed, so-called, to market forces. And so actually it was in their material interest. A, a key, I won't digress too much into this, but a, a key figure in all of this actually is Peter Mandelson. Because when Peter Mandelson was a commissioner, he was actually very instrumental in leading the charge for a neoliberal restructuring of Europe's highly protected sugar beet industries, right? So the argument is that- Trade largely, commissioner. Yes. As trade commissioner. Indeed, as trade commissioner, exactly. So the argument is that uh, on this side is that, is that large sugar producers uh, appealed to sympathetic actors inside the commission because they actually realised that it was in their material interest. Another, another school of thought, and this is a slightly more abstract one, and that's probably why it's more appealing to me, is um, you, could, you could use a Polanyian argument here, I think. You know, you could say that it's all about embeddedness, you know, very briefly. Again, we don't have time to expatiate at great length. But Karl Polanyi, his key theory, um, whether he liked it or not, his key theory was embeddedness, the embeddedness of markets. And basically that means that, you know, there is no such, there is no such thing as a pure market. You always have markets embedded in social relations and those social relations manifest themselves in the modern world in regulation and so on. And so really, um, and he wrote about this, not specifically on sugar, but that the, the EU was a, you know, a tame empire as such, a post-colonial empire of metropoles clustered together and um, 
protective, you know, highly protective of domestic industries and labor and so on. And so he would, you know, I don't know whether he would, but I would conceptualize it for an embedded lens that actually, and actually, you know, you, you can find some of this in the literature, agricultural exceptionalism and so on, that looks at this through a kind of lens of embeddedness that says you cannot disembed, in other words, you cannot expose entirely to market forces, the key agricultural mm -hmm. industries of Europe. They must remain somehow connected uh, to, to the social topsoil, as it were. Okay. The next question is, how has the EU sugar regime affected producers in the global south? Yeah, I mean, that's a very important question. And I almost consciously left out the, the parallel story that unfolds with the CMO or Common Market Organization of Sugar. Alongside the CMO, you have the Sugar Protocol, which emerges out of a kind of predecessor, a much less developed, much less comprehensive predecessor arrangement called the Yaoundai Agreement. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Lomé is signed in 1975 uh, between the uh, European Community and various former colonies of the states that make up the European communities. And within the Hyundai Accords, you have the Sugar Protocol, which is basically built on actually very generous uh, quotas of sugar to be imported into the European Union from producer countries in the global south, many of them, if not all of them, I think, former colonies. And also, twinned with that, a guaranteed price mechanism, which was very closely linked to the common market organization of sugar's inter internal price, which it's very important to say floats way above the world market price of sugar throughout the period that it lasts. So it's signed in 1975, the Sugar Protocol, as part of the Lomé Accords. It has about 19 signatories. Uh, which receive different quotas according to their productive capacities at that moment in time. Mauritius, which is where my research comes into it, I suppose, Mauritius receives the largest quota. Jamaica receives the fourth largest quota for sugar. And they all receive the same generous uh, price inflated guaranteed price. This, I think, is interesting because for one thing, it reflects, well, it reflects a couple of things. For one, it reflects, and let's not be too Panglossian about it, it reflects Britain and France particularly's uh, desire to project so-called soft power after the, after the collapse of their empires. And one way of doing this, of course, is, is by uh, paternalistic developmental uh, uh, mechanisms. The other is indeed development, you know, uh, uh, to get away from uh, the, the slightly, slightly more cynical interpretation, development was a watchword, as we know, uh, uh, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, and genuine or not, there were, you know, huge departments of international institutions and indeed regional bodies like the EU that were committed to uh, development along you know, capitalist principles within a Keynesian context, right? So I think the, the key thing to say is that Lomé reflects those two sets of, of those two impulses. It reflects those zeitgeists and um, it was itself subject eventually to neoliberal retrenchment uh, after mm -hmm. the introduction of the Cotonou Agreement in 2000. Sugar again, survives Cotonou for, for longer than any other commodity, longer than bananas, longer than beef, longer than anything else signed originally in, in the Lomé Accords. It survives till 2009 when it's finally phased out. And what we have in its place is a series of relation, a, a series of trade deals between the European Union and individual parties that formerly made up the bloc that now organize under the rubric of the ACP, the uh, African Caribbean Pacific Partnership. Okay. And the final question, I guess, which is the one that relates to the bigger picture, although all of your answers thus far do relate to the bigger picture, is how would you conceptualize these processes that you have uh, described thus far? Yeah. Um, 
only in ways that reconstitute what I've what I've already said, I'm afraid. But I think I can just sort of bring it all together, perhaps synthesize it. Mm. Well, first of all, um, I would conceptualize, you know, the EC, EU, ACP relationship. As I pre just mentioned, I would say that it's best understood through the kind of the twin lens of those zeitgeists. Yeah, understanding it as part of post-colonial paternalism and an attempt to project soft power, but also uh, a, a genuine attempt, misguided or not, ultimately nefarious or not, at development in the kind of uh, the kind of 1960s American political science sense. Um, Conceptualise the CMO and the need to embed or the need to compartmentalise, as it's often described in the literature, sugar so that it's heavily protected, even beyond initial neoliberal retrenchment. You know, again, compartmentalisation is the language that's frequently used in EU scholarship. And I think that's fine. But I think it's a little bit a tautological because then you say, well, what is compartmentalization? Well, it's protection. So it's just another word for protection, really. So it becomes a little bit tautological at a certain point. And I also think it becomes a little bit desiccate, a little bit dry at a certain point. Mm -hmm. I think embeddedness, personally, I, I, I want to push this uh, view that the Polanyian embeddedness is a useful way of conceptualizing uh, sugar, sugar's sugar's relationship with EU, EU policy making from sugar beet production onwards, but particularly in the context of the development of the EC and the EU. So I guess one way to uh, end this interview is to um, uh, invite those who have not uh, yet read Polanyi or uh, have not done so recently to go back to the uh, original uh, work and um, try to draw lessons from it. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed, it's been very interesting um, and I hope we will have the chance to welcome you back to the video blog series in the future as your research and your career uh, develops. Again, thanks very much for spending your time with us today. It was my pleasure, dear thank you.